Tonight on Newsnight Scotland, what kind of lives will we live in the future? And does the result of the independence referendum have much bearing on them? In a special programme, I'm joined by a panel of experts on the way we live from earliest childhood to our last years. Are we asking the right questions about childcare? Do we really want a more equal society? And does anyone know the answers to the problems posed by an ageing population? Good evening. We hear a lot of what the politicians promise in the referendum campaign. Tonight we're asking a panel of highly qualified and impartial experts to identify and discuss some of the problems and possible solutions which Scottish society will face in the coming years, whatever the constitutional arrangements may be. Professor Susan Deakin wrote the report on early years care for the Scottish Government. Professor Kirsten Romery teaches child, researches child care, elderly care, social care and gender equality. Professor Phil Hanlon is an expert in public health. Professor Pauline Banks is director of the Institute of Older People's Health and Wellbeing. David Watt is di executive director of the Institute for Directors Scotland. Professor Joe Armstrong is an economist with the Centre for Public Policy for the Regions. And Dave Moxham is deputy general secretary of the T Scottish TUC. Well, look, let's start with early years, which has been a subject of much debate in the referendum, particularly about childcare costs, Susan Deakin. But I'm wondering whether you think that's actually really the right debate to be having. Well, I have mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, like a lot of people, I'm delighted that we're talking about a really important issue that affects children and families. But the way that we've arrived at this debate and the way we're conducting it is, is odd, to say the least. I mean, we don't need constitutional change to increase and improve childcare in this country. That's just a fact. And I, I know also I'm not alone in having a concern that we're having this debate predicated on the notion that all these women would, could and should suddenly go back to work if they have more childcare available. I, I, you know, we're not talking about children, we're not talking about choice. But most of all, I think my concern would be that we're still failing to have a grounded and rounded conversation about the things that make a difference to a child's early life experience and so much of that goes on in the home but, but, but and well, in the that's community. The, point. The, the objection I suppose to the, the way the debate is being framed at the moment is that it's actually not a debate about children, it's a debate about adults well, and absolutely. getting adults back to work. Absolutely and you know yes it's, it's important and it's crucially important that we talk about the economy in the same breath as we talk about social issues, I don't think we do that nearly enough but we've extracted this one very narrow um, you know scenario that affects a, a narrow group of, of women or supposedly affects a certain number of women in the population that we're now going to flick a switch and it's all going to change as I say we need to broaden this right out we're not for the first time massively oversimplifying a really important um, issue that affects not just all of us as individuals, but has a huge impact on our society. Um, well, uh, Joe Armstrong, the, the other thing that's going rather undiscussed, isn't it, is, is actually whether there's any economic rationale. I mean, even some of the, 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 the um, um, charities and all the rest of it who are campaigning in this say, oh, it's great, we're now taking this as an economically serious issue. Yeah. But there are economists who say that while providing more childcare may well be a good thing for social reasons, there's no economic case for it whatsoever. It's certainly a difficult one to see show real cause and effect and certainly show real cause and effect over a relatively short period of time. I, mean, I think you would be uh, investing in early years for the life chances of individuals and that would hopefully reduce inequalities and, and help develop economic uh, productivity from those individuals in later years. But it's extremely difficult to see the evidence that says the significant economic benefits from intervention of, of childcare care. But, but what, what about in the short term? increasing childcare payments so that people go back to work? Is there an economic case for that? Well again, unless it's targeted, you're potentially giving money to people who would otherwise be paying for it in any case. So it's redistributive and it may actually be unproductive. Redistribution. Right, so when uh, politicians of whatever stripe say, hey, we'll pay for this because of the economic benefits it will bring, you, you would caution a, a healthy dose of skepticism. Certainly to, to show the net additional benefits accruing short to medium term, yes, very difficult to see. 
Phil Hanna, what, what do you make of this? Do you think this debate has been framed in the right way? Yeah, I'd agree with Susan, it's too narrow. I mean, if you ask the question, is there an economic, social, health and societal benefit of giving children the best possible start in life, then the evidence for that is unequivocal. Are there many children in Scotland who are not having that best start in life? Yes, definitely. Inequalities but, but, is a but, major but, but, but driver issue, of that. If the, you could deal with that, right. then but the issue, one the issue, small the point component is that, that yeah. paying more childcare so that people go back could to work be one is small, not necessarily no. the same issue as the one you were exactly talking about. Exactly so. It could be one small component. And that's the frustration I think many people in Scotland are feeling about the debate uh, about the referendum, is that they recognise, people understand what it takes to raise a child and the complexity of it all. You know, if you said to a mother who's just seen their child leave secondary school, who's flourished in all ways, um, what was the one thing that achieved it? The mother would think this a ridiculous uh, question. And equally so, the idea that one intervention will transform early years in Scotland is equally ridiculous. But the question, I think, needs to be asked, because we need to debate things policy by policy, could that policy be part of a more comprehensive set of interventions that make a real difference to the early years? Well, that's, that's a question worth asking, and I think it depends how it's done and what else is put in alongside it. What's the employer's perspective in this, David? What, I mean, if there were an economic rationale for it, you would expect employers to be lobbying like mad for the state to pay more childcare. Yeah, I, th I think employers want two things. I, want, I think they probably want to see the best possible output at the long-term end of the education system whenever it starts. So they want to see what they would see as suitable potential employees coming out of, whether it's school system, whether it's 16, 18, out of colleges, out of universities. So to, I, I think to some extent they would understand to some degree the sooner the start, the better, I think, from that economic point of view. And I think secondly, they would be very happy to see a number of parents, male or female, being more available to the workforce through better childcare being provided. But again, that's back to the debate, is, is it about the child or is it about the, the employer or the employee and, and the adult or is it about the child? And I think Phil's point is, if we're trying to improve the child and the next generation, then you know employers would want to see that happen. But as Joe said, how long can they wait for that benefit to come to some degree? But I think in, in general terms, they'd be in favour of it, but they're not expecting it to be a, have a massive economic benefit to them or to the economy tomorrow. Right, and you pres your members presumably would we should, we should point out that it's, it, you know, various parties are members, proposing various our members things are, on childcare. Our care. members are the professionals who would want to deliver better and better funded childcare and they're obviously many of the people um, that use it and the broad range of benefits as have been described is of course um, the, right, uh, the right approach to this. But there is a fundamental difficulty that no one is really addressing as part of the referendum debate which is Nobody would blink at the thought of paying um, tax to educate a five-year-old um, in school, but the, the political argument has probably not yet been won as to why you might pay more tax in order to provide the sort of wraparound childcare that, um, well, that a zero okay. to five-year-old might need. No one's really grasped that net yet, and okay. you know, for all of its positive noises, some of the things that the white paper did was actually to deflect us from that argument and towards a an economistic model which frankly is can doubtful I, in terms sorry. of whether it works. Can I just take issue with mm. the separation of the economic and the social policy aspect of this and the idea that it's about either working parents or children because what the international evidence shows is if you invest in early years it has several benefits. One is it gets more women and lower paid men into work and that is very good at tackling child poverty and family poverty. Secondly, investment... Sorry, just, when you say when you invest in early care, you, you mean giving parents more support in going back to work, do you? Is that, is that I what mean, you mean partly that, but also investing in an infrastructure that provides decent, high-quality childcare. So you're investing in the workforce. You're seeing childcare as part of an economic investment, just as you would transport or any other kind of infrastructure investment, rather than a cost and a drain. We also know that investment in early years benefits children extremely, and the outcomes in terms of both their employment prospects in the future and their educational attainment in the future is but, much, But again, much I just better. want to be clear, when you say investment in early years in that respect, that it benefits the children, what do you mean by that? Do you mean 
it's better to have children in nurseries rather than at home with their families. The is international that what you evidence shows that a mix of both is the best outcome. If you have children who are just at home with parents, their outcomes are poor. And if you have parent, children who spend an awful lot of time in early years, particularly in an early age, the outcomes are poorer. But it's very, very complex because one of the main things that childcare investment in childcare achieves is it, is it tackles family poverty because it gets parents into work and that is the surest way of getting those families out of poverty. And it's actually poverty that has the severely negative impact on children um, rather than the actual lack of childcare per se. So if you invest in the family being able to work and you invest in also childcare as an industry, you're getting more people into work and you're also putting money into poorer families who are more likely to spend it in the local economy to, to um, okay. build up the infrastructure. But you would say case unproven. Well, well, they may well spend it in the local community, but they may also be spending their benefits in the local community. So the net effect is a difficult one to say is absolutely significantly improved. Uh, okay. Uh, Polly Banks, I, I know in a way your area is more the other end of life, but I'm, I'm just curious as to what you make of the way this whole debate has been framed. <laughs> so this is a difficult one for me to come in at this stage because it's not the area that I'm working in. But certainly um, for families to work together it's very important and there are a lot of grandparents who are involved in, in child care and of course the changes in the pension age are also going to make a difference to the availability of grandparents to do yeah. that if we're working for longer years. So every, every different policy has a different impact in the age group and it will knock, knock on us. Because, because that, that is an issue. I mean just, everyone talks about the, the, that rather cliched phrase now, the university of mum and dad is for the problems that young people are having on the housing market but, but there's a sort of uh, labour force of grandma and granddad, isn't there? For a huge amount of, of childcare carried out by grandparents. Right. Yes. Uh, the other danger of this debate, presumably, Susan Deacon, is, is that um, it, it, the more you argue an economic case for childcare support, the more likely you are to try to reduce what we call early years. But, but in some kind, I mean, Finland, for example, everyone says, oh, the Finnish education system is absolutely marvellous they don't send their children to school for ages, do they? I mean, the, 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 the whole thought is that I think they're six or seven before they go to school. Well, I think we have to be very, very careful about international comparisons. I think we should learn, we should compare. But I remember in a former life being dispatched to Finland in January. It was, it was very cold, I recall. That was a punishment, to, wasn't to it? To look at what they'd done to improve the national diet and reduce heart disease. And I immediately came away with a very clear sense um, of just what a different cultural context it was, what a different political context it was, how the involvement of business and employers was different and so on and so forth and they had a different set of problems that they hadn't solved either. So I think you know this, this, this thing that's become very fashionable particularly with the Nordic nations of saying let's follow what's done over there and all will be well with Scotland is really really it, well, it has to be treated with caution. But on this issue of investing, if I could pick up on a couple of the points made. Um, I think Kirsten's point about, you know, recognising the importance in a more, in a broader sense of investing in early years and investing indeed, I would say, in the family mm. is hugely important. And I don't think that that's something that is centre stage enough in our discussions. You know, and David touched on some of the issues for employers, for example. Now, you know, so often when we talk about the skills that we need in this country, we talk about what we do with or for youngsters from the age of 16 onwards. Now, the fact of the matter is the foundation stones are laid, you know, in the first few years of life when it comes to language, when it comes to routines, boundaries, ability to communicate and connect with other human beings. So, you know, there is absolutely an interconnected economic and social interest there. But what I would also say, picking up since the point about grandparents has been raised, and I think even the way you framed one of your points there, Gordon, is the kind of thing that worries me slightly is that we're talking there about grandparents as this sort of unpaid labour force. The grandparent-child relationship, and indeed the grandparent-parent relationship where there are children involved, can be one of the most valuable okay. relationships there is. And, you know, we've got to... We've got to broaden our discussion here to not just think about professional interventions and public spend. We, all of us, need to okay. be investing time and money in our children. All right, look, just to finish this area, Joe Armstrong, I mean, if you're right in what you say about the economics of this, I mean, coming back to a point that, that Dave Moxon was, was making, I mean, is the referendum in itself particularly relevant to this? In other words, is it really a debate about what you would have 
if Scotland's independent versus what you would have um, uh, under, under more devolution, for example? Or, or is it actually a broader debate, as Dave Moxon was alluding to, about well, look, whatever mechanism you choose, if you want more childcare, we're going to have to pay for it. We're going to have to pay for it through our taxes. Yeah. And that debate is not really being had. Yeah.